Hello and thank you for joining us for today's video about three cold cases that were solved in 2022. We know we're well into 2023 right now, but these cases were so fascinating that we had to talk about them. So we really appreciate you checking out this video and hopefully you find the cases interesting as well. Of course, we think it's great when cold cases are solved. That's why we have our podcast, Into the Killing, where we talk about cold cases that were eventually solved. You can listen to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and anywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Or you can wait until the video is posted on our channel. But before we get any further into today's video, we want to talk about our amazing sponsor, Magellan TV. Is your New Year's resolution to become more knowledgeable about the world? Or are you simply looking for something new to watch? Then you should check out Magellan TV, the best documentary streaming service on the planet. It's the number one rated documentary streaming app in the Google Play Store. It's a hidden gem when it comes to quality and price. They have an excellent collection of true crime documentaries that you won't find anywhere else. An amazing documentary I just watched is called The Mind of Mark DeFries. In 1980, Mark DeFries' father died, and in his will, he gave Mark some tools. One day, Mark took the tools, but they were still in probate, so technically, they didn't belong to him yet. His stepmother called the police, and Mark tried to escape. At the time, Mark was mentally ill. He was arrested, and he was sentenced to four years in prison. Then, Mark kept escaping from prison, earning the nickname the Houdini of Florida, and he ended up serving 27 years in solitary confinement. The documentary is fascinating, infuriating, and heartbreaking, and after watching it, you may end up questioning what you believe about the prison system. You should check out The Mind of Mark DeFries the next time you want to watch something thought-provoking. Right now, you can check out The Mind of Mark DeFries and thousands of other documentaries on Magellan TV for free because Magellan TV is giving criminally listed viewers 30 days of free service. To get this amazing offer, just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed. Please check out Magellan TV today because you'll find something great to watch and you'll be supporting criminally listed in the process. Number 3. James Tappan Hall In the autumn of 1971, 53-year-old James Tappan Hall was a special deputy sheriff in Montgomery County, Maryland. He was a husband, father, and grandfather. On the night of October 23, 1971, Hall was working as a security guard at the Manor Country Club in Rockville, Maryland. Hall wasn't supposed to be working that night. Instead, he was filling in for a friend who couldn't work. At 10.40 p.m., some guests came into the country club and said a man was on the ground in the parking lot and he had a head injury. That man was James Tappan Hall. He had been shot in the back of the head with a small caliber gun. His service weapon was lying beside him, but it had not been fired. The investigators surmised Hall interrupted a burglary at a home near the country club's parking lot. Hall was taken to the hospital. The 53-year-old grandfather never regained consciousness and died three days after being shot. Investigators worked on the case for years, but eventually the case went cold. Decades went by. Eventually, he became the oldest and only unsolved homicide in the county involving law enforcement. In October 2021, on the 50th anniversary of the murder, the cold case unit decided to reopen the case. They reviewed all the evidence, and one name that kept coming up was Larry David Becker. Becker was 19 years old at the time of the murder. Becker grew up near the country club. He also had a criminal record. He had convictions for burglary, assault, shoplifting, and escape. The police had interviewed Becker in 1973. At the time, they didn't consider him a suspect in the case, but they did think he might have known what had happened to Hall. The cold case investigators found the reel-to-reel -reel recording of the interview with Becker from 1973. The investigators sent the reels to the FBI and they were converted into digital. Then they listened to the audio and noticed that Becker mentioned things about the crime that were never made public. For example, he knew how many shots were fired at Hall. The cold case investigators decided to talk to Becker if he was still alive. 
It turned out he was still alive. Around 1975, four years after the murder, Becker changed his last name to Smith. He also moved out of state. For 45 years, he had been living in Little Falls, New York. The investigators thought that the fact that he changed his name and moved out of state was suspicious. Becker, who was now Smith, was 70 years old and he was living in a public housing apartment building for older people and people with disabilities. In September 2022, the cold case investigators interviewed Smith about the murder. He confessed to killing James Tappan Hall. He said he was robbing a house near the country club. He had parked his car in the dark parking lot of the country club. When he returned to his car, he was surprised to find Hall there and he accidentally shot him. He didn't even realize he had killed him. However, the investigators didn't believe him. They think that he ambushed Hall. 51 years after the murder of James Tappan Hall, Larry David Smith, formerly known as Larry David Becker, was charged with first degree murder. He chose not to fight extradition. He was sent back to Maryland, where he is currently awaiting trial. Number 2. Nancy Anderson Nancy Anderson was born in 1952 in Bay City, Michigan, and she grew up there. She had nine siblings. After graduating high school, she moved to Colorado, where she worked as a waitress. She had always dreamed of living in Hawaii, so she moved to Honolulu in 1971. She got a small apartment with a roommate in Wakakiki, a neighborhood in Honolulu. She got a job at McDonald's near her apartment. Anderson planned on living the island life before going to college. On January 7, 1972, Anderson's roommate, Jody Spooner, returned home and there were two men in the apartment with Anderson. Spooner thought that they were salesmen. Spooner went to her bedroom and a short time later, she heard Anderson show the men out. Spooner then fell asleep. At 4.15 p.m., Spooner thought she heard a scream, but she didn't get out of bed. 45 minutes later, Spooner woke up and thought she heard water coming from Anderson's room. She thought that was odd because Anderson should be at work already. She went into the bedroom and made a gruesome discovery. 18-year-old Nancy Anderson had been brutally stabbed to death. She had been stabbed in the neck, chest, stomach, back, sides, and both arms. The medical examiner found 63 wounds. Five were exit wounds from when the knife went through her body. She had not been sexually assaulted. The police had several suspects. This included the salesmen who were at her apartment earlier that day. But they cooperated with the investigation. They gave their fingerprints and underwent a polygraph exam. They ended up being cleared as suspects. The police also looked at Anderson's ex-boyfriends and they were all cleared. The building manager was also cleared as a suspect. Eventually, the case went cold. However, the police did have the killer's DNA. It was found on a towel in the apartment. Another bloody towel was found on the fire escape. It also had the killer's blood on it. Nearly five decades went by. Then in 2021, the police received a tip from an anonymous caller. They gave the police the name of a suspect and explained why they should investigate him. He was 77-year-old Tudor Trilla who lived in Reno, Nevada. The police never revealed what the anonymous caller said to have them investigate Trilla, but they did investigate him. At the time of the murder, Trilla was a graduate assistant at the University of Hawaii, which was close to Anderson's apartment. He then went to law school in Sacramento, California. At some point, he moved to Nevada. In 1979, he got his law license. He practiced law in Carson City, the Incline Village, in Reno. According to lawandcrime.com, in the 1980s, 
He was a deputy attorney general and a senior assistant to the Reno city attorney. At some point, he went to private practice. He mostly worked on taxation issues and estate issues. In 1994, Trilla unsuccessfully ran for the Nevada Supreme Court. Although Trilla was a lawyer, he had some brushes with the law. In 1994, while he was running for the Nevada Supreme Court, he was arrested for failing to pay child support for his three children. He was supposed to pay his ex-wife $995 every month. He had fallen behind to the point where he owed his ex-wife $33,000. He ended up being jailed for eight days. In 1995, Trilla was charged with kidnapping after he allegedly tied up his girlfriend with the intention of raping her. But those charges were dropped. Then in 1998, Trilla was involved in an unusual lawsuit. He sued the owner of the Mustang Ranch brothel, Joe Confronte, for $14 million. Trilla had been president of the company that allegedly was the legal front for the brothel. Trilla claimed he was wrongly fired for cooperating with federal prosecutors. He also claimed he was fired because he refused to launder money. However, the case didn't make it very far because Confronte had fled the country to avoid federal charges. After getting the anonymous tip, the police tracked down one of Trilla's sons They got a DNA sample from him. They compared it to the DNA left on the towels. The results indicated that the blood on the towels belonged to the donor's biological father. On September 6, 2022, the police got a warrant to collect a sample of Trilla's DNA. They went to his home after he recently had eye surgery. They collected a saliva sample from him. It was a match to the DNA on the bloody towels. On September 13, 2022, nearly 50 years after Nancy Anderson's murder, 77-year-old Tudor Chirilla was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. He initially fought extradition because he claimed his constitutional rights were violated when his DNA was taken. But in December 2022, he was extradited to Hawaii, where he is currently awaiting trial. Number 1. William Deshaun Hamilton On February 26, 1999, a worker at a small church cemetery in DeKalb County, Georgia, was getting ready for a burial. In a wooded area next to the cemetery, he made a disturbing discovery. It was the skeletized body of a young boy. The medical examiner believed he was between the ages of four and seven. He was dressed in a hoodie, red denim jeans, and Timberland boots. The boy was of African American descent. The medical examiner thought that the remains had been there for three to six months. The medical examiner thought that what was strange was that he had been taken care of before his death, but no one had reported him missing. How could a boy who was school age go missing and no one like a relative, teacher, or neighbor reported missing? Yet, he did not match any missing persons reports on the local or national databases. Due to the state of the remains, the medical examiner could not determine the cause of death. Eventually, investigators nicknamed the young John Doe, Dennis. Shortly after Dennis's body was found, the police had a clay rendering of his face done and they dressed the model in clothes that were similar to what the boy was wearing. However, it didn't lead to the boy being identified. He was buried in the cemetery close to where his body was found. His headstone was left blank. Then, the case went cold. In February 2019, 20 years after the boy's remains were found, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released new images that were created with new forensic tools. The images were widely circulated. Then over a year later, in May 2020, a woman, only identified as Ava, called the National Center for Exploited and Missing Children. She said that she believed Dennis was a six-year-old boy named William Deshaun Hamilton. 
Ava explained that she lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, and she was friends with William's mother, Teresa Ann Bailey Black. Ava said that for four years she babysat William. She looked after him before and after school and loved the boy dearly. She described him as being an older man in a child's body. He used to read the encyclopedia and liked knowing the definitions of big words. Ava didn't have as many good things to say about William's mother, Teresa Black. She said that Teresa wasn't a loving or affectionate mother. She was often distant and impatient with the boy. In December 1998, when William was six, about two months before Dennis's remains were found, Teresa suddenly pulled William out of school. She told people that they were moving to Atlanta, Georgia, where they had relatives. Ava remembers saying goodbye to William. She said it was devastating. Ava said that later, in 1999, Teresa returned to Charlotte, but she was alone. Ava asked about William several times. What bothered Ava was that Teresa always had a different story about what she did with William. She became so disturbed that she started looking for William herself. She would go to the local library and get phone books for different places in Georgia. She would photocopy pages and get numbers for places like hospitals, homeless shelters, bus stations, and etc. But she found no trace of William. Life, as it does, continued for Ava. Teresa moved away from Charlotte and Ava lost contact with her. Ava began a relationship and had two daughters, but she never gave up looking for William. As the years went by, she began to search the internet for traces of William. Then in May 2020, Ava saw the images of Dennis that were released a year earlier in February 2019. She instantly knew it was William. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children passed the tip on to the authorities. The authorities learned that Teresa Black was living in Phoenix, Arizona. In February 2022, they got a sample of her DNA. In mid-July 2022, 23 years after the remains of the young John Doe, known as Dennis, were found, the authorities in DeKalb County announced that they had confirmed his identity. He was six-year-old William Deshaun Hamilton. The authorities also said that they had indicted Teresa Ann Bailey Black. She was arrested the next day in Tucson and charged with two counts of felony murder, two counts of cruelty to children, aggravated assault, and concealing the death of another. Teresa said she would not fight extradition. So it's believed that she's in DeKalb County, Georgia, awaiting the trial for the murder of her son. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.